Joe. Joe on Joe is the only podcast where Joe talks about Joe. And now, your host, Joe Slepsky. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's me, your host, Joe Slepsky. And you are tuning in to Joe on Joe. And this week, it's another episode of Joe on Joe Illustrated. Now, this is the podcast where we watch every episode of G.I. Joe, where we read every comic book of G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, in sequential order. Uh, We've done most of the cartoons. We're going to be getting back to them in August. Actually, I'm starting to line up some interviews now, which is really exciting for me. And we are chugging along on our Joe on Joe Illustrated episodes. And this week is no different with G.I. Joe, issue number 89. Cover date, August of 89. Uh, Actual publication date, uh, April of 1989. Really excited today, guys, because if you follow me on social media, which you should, it's at Joe on Joe Pod, that's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, And if you're paying attention on social media, you might have seen a little teaser the last couple days. I've got a great giveaway for you today. Now, you have to listen to this whole episode to find out what it is. So we're going to, at the end of this episode, I'm going to give you the details, but trust me, you will not be disappointed. There are prizes galore, and it's all around Snake Eyes. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but Joe, why are we doing uh, G.I. Joe 89 when Dead Game 5 dropped this week? The culmination of the year-long five-issue miniseries that uh, we've been waiting to see what happens with Snake Eyes playing Thor, the God of Thunder. Why aren't you covering Dead Game this week? It's because we're doing it next week. We're doing it next week for the drop of the movie. Also, uh, as I'm recording this, it's the day before my birthday, and I didn't want to ruin my birthday with a Dead Game review. I'm just kidding. No, that's actually, we're going to have some fun with that episode. So I hope you guys listen to it next week in here. And we're also, next week, we're going to uh, probably... Probably have the winners. Oh, no, I actually, I won't. You know what? Next week's episode, I won't have the winners because I'm recording it before. Uh, I'm recording it early. So I'll be recording it before I have the winners of uh, the t- the the exciting contest today. So you'll have to stay tuned to find out who won uh, today's contest to the next week. This is like that sketch, uh, the taped live call-in show. Was that from... Uh, that Mr. Show is brilliant. Anyway, uh, love you guys. Love my listeners. Love my followers on email on uh, social media at Joe and Joe Pod. Love people who send me an email to Joe on Joe Pod at gmail.com. Take note of that email. That's going to come in handy today for entering the contest. Uh, and I really love our sponsor, the Movies and a Meal podcast. So why don't we hear from them? Listeners, I know what you need in your life. You need more podcasts. And you also love movies. So why not do a podcast that's about not not one movie, it's about not two movies, it's about three movies and a meal. I'm talking the movies and a meal podcast. This show is great. It's brought to you by Keith, Brad, and Ben, and each week they bring a new movie to the table, which they all discuss as a group. And it's not, you know, your highfalutin movies, it's... What We Do in the Shadows, The Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, and Out of Sight. You know, it's Bad Education, Ghost Rider, and A View to a Kill. It's X-Men Last Stand, Queen Sugar, The Mandalorian, and Major League Two. They are a lot of fun to listen to. You guys know Ben. It's our friend Ben Penserga. He was a guest on Joe and Joe. In fact, Ben was the very first remote guest that I ever had on this podcast, so he's always got a special place in my heart. I'm really digging this. I, I just started listening to it last week. It is a lot of fun. They bring a guest in. The guest, uh, I, I listened to their Heather's episode. They they were joined by Kelly, and she went in-depth on her favorite movie, which was Heather's, and it made me want to go watch Heather's to watch with them. I really dig it. So, guys, find them out there, at Movies and a Meal, Twitter, Instagram. Their website is moviesandameal.podbean.com. They put out one episode a week. Give them a listen, guys. Support them. Let them know Joe on Joe sent you. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. It is quite entertaining. And now back to the show. The other exciting thing that happened this week is I got my Target reorders in. So I finally got my hands on Firefly. I think I thought I think I already had a beachhead, but I got a beachhead and I got a Cobra Trooper. So um, 
very exciting stuff. Very exciting stuff. I know that uh, we were, you know, in California, it was like 6 a.m. We were waking up early last week and, and hitting hit in order. So I want to add the chorus of thank yous. If anyone from Hasbro or Target or listening or out there, uh, thank you guys for listening to the fans, uh, if that had anything to do with factoring, with making more of these available. Um, but I have a feeling that it did. And going back to the drawing board and kind of uh, and making a lot more available, uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, fans, uh, listeners, that's a sign. Let's assuming again, assuming that's what they did. That's a sign that you know uh, companies are run by people, and people make people uh, make mistakes. Not that they're mistakes, but people make choices, and sometimes they over they over order. Sometimes they under order, and there's always the opportunity for someone to sit back and go, "Hey, let's let's fix this. Let's make more," you know fireflies and make them available again uh yeah they're going to sell through but it's really making them available for people who really want them and so that's really done by people that's on a very that's a personal level so i want everyone out there to keep that in mind and think about it and uh you know next time you're shouting out at at some company there, there's for the most part there's there's people behind there sometimes they're robotic ais controlled by a mustache twirling uh, dentist but that's neither here nor there what is here today is G.I. Joe number 89, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about this book because it's got the debut of one of my favorite G.I. Joe artists, Mark Bright, and um, he would go on to do a lot of really good issues of G.I. Joe that I really, really appreciate, and I love his artwork, and I love his stuff, um, uh, like on, on uh, Green Lantern, his Emerald Dawn stuff, Um Quantum and Woody was fantastic. He did he did a nice little run on uh, Black Panther. Like I'm a fan of Mark Bright's work, so I'm excited to get into it. But before we do, you know how we always start. You were saying, and we look at comic books that were on the shelf the same month that the issue in question was. So Joe 89 was on the same shelf. It shared shelf space with these comic books from DC Comics, Action Comics 644. Uh, another fabulous George Perez cover. I feel like, I feel like until he stops doing covers, I'm always gonna, my eyes are always gonna be drawn to that. But this is um, Superman in heavy shadow. It's, it's, a, he's got like a, a, basically a black and white look on him. You don't even see his face. It's just his costume, and it just, it just looks so different from most all Superman covers. Uh, looks obviously the draftsmanship is fantastic, but it's the layout and the style choices that Perez choice uh, chooses to do in this, and you're not used to seeing that, especially then pre um death of superman pre else worlds right you weren't used to seeing a lot of like dark images of superman you know even in the silver age when they were doing a lot of you know red k stuff and superman being crazy sometimes a bad guy sometimes it was always superman you know it was always red blue and yellow and it was you know like the the color schemes are always still the same and the you know the, the, this is this is one of the early like Oh, that's that's a just a different way to draw, different way to look at Superman in action. Or well, not really on action. He's kind of posing, not really in action, but it's great. It's a, it's a really gorgeous cover. Check it out if you can. Uh, what else we got? Okay, Batman four thirty six. This is Batman Year three. So hot on the heels of Batman Year two, which was hot on the heels of Batman Year one. They start to tell um, the and actually George Perez cover too. They start to tell the origin of um, this is Robin. So this is dealing with. Uh, uh, Dick Grayson, Robin, his origins. And so they're calling it year three. So like the year Batman took on Robin, who would become Nightwing. Uh, it's, it's overlooked. It's, you know, like year two had diminishing returns off of year one, which year one is one of the greatest Batman stories ever told. And year three had similar ones. Uh, it, it, uh, it just, it just had similar, it doesn't get the love that it probably deserves. Cause it's really well told, but you're also talking about, you know, the second sequel to, to a story so it's it's it always usually does get lost in the shuffle but there's some great covers and it's a really fun story and it it really ties in with um nightwing and it leads a, it, it, if memory serves it really leads into the introduction of uh of uh tim drake so i think i think tim drake gets introduced just in not terribly short order after this uh after they wrap this story up in um lonely place of dying so it's good, but yeah, it crosses over. So in Batman 436 and also Batman 437. Oh, here we go. So now, guys, remember, we're in 1989. So what is 1989? It's the year of the bat. Speaking of bat, so the official comic book adaptation is on the shelf. 
uh, issue now, or the, like the first volume of it. I love this. I love that DC's revisiting it later this summer. I believe in August the comic drops. They're doing Batman 89 comic, and they're also doing a Superman 78 comic. So check your local listings for that one. I cannot wait to read those books. The The movie adaptation was great. Jerry Ordway, fantastic job on it. Um, I think I avoided this. I think I was smart enough to avoid it because I had burned myself the, in the years prior with being spoiled on like Temple of Doom and Return of the Jedi. And I think I even spoiled myself with the Empire Strikes Back adaptation when I was really, I was like six or seven or however old I would have been. I think I spoiled myself with that by reading the adaptation first. Um, so when, ba- when this book came out, I'm fairly sure I avoided it because I was so excited for Batman, man, we're, I mean, we should, yeah, we should just do a whole podcast called Batman 89 and just talk about all the stuff that went into that year. And I'm sure I'll talk more about it in the, in the, uh, coming issues as more Batman 89 stuff pops up. But, uh, uh, April of 89 was just, that was all we could talk me, Irish, Pat Finnegan, you know, you're out there, Pat. This was all we were talking about. And so the movie adaptation came out. It's just fabulous. I think they just reprinted in a trade. I feel like I saw this on the shelf. Uh, They collected all the movie adaptations into one trade, which would be a lot of fun to read. I don't have to because I already got them. But if you guys don't have them, they're a whole lot of fun, especially if you're, you know, obviously a big fan. Hawk World number one. One of the most problematic books in DC Comics history. Because after Crisis, they rebooted everything. Uh, you know, all the continuity cracks started happening, right? There was no Superboy, so you got no uh, no Legion of Superheroes. When they redid Wonder Woman, they said that she wasn't in World War II, and so she was she was actually a, uh, she just came to the modern world now. So that means where was she during the formation of the Justice League? So they had to fix that. They they taped that up with Black Canary. And Hawkworld comes around, and Hawkworld originally was designed to be set kind of historical. In fact, it actually has no real tie to current DC continuity at all. So Hawkworld itself is continuity free. And let me tell you, it is amazing. Timothy Truman uh, and what Alfredo Alcala, I believe. Let me verify that. Uh, Enrique, I'm sorry, Enrique. Al- I'm sorry. Pardon me, Enrique Al- Alcatania. I got confused. Um, and Tim Truman did uh, wrote and penciled it. Hawkworld is fabulous. It's three issues. It's a reimagining, reinvigoration of the Hawkman mythos. This is before they would do it um, more recently where they got into like the reincarnation stuff, which I think works and I think works to fix a lot of the continuity holes they, they dug themselves into. But at the time, this was just saying, hey, post-crisis, let's kind of give a refresh to Hawkman. The problem comes in four months or so when they ask John Ostrander to turn Hawkworld into an ongoing series, and then they say, and set it in modern times, and this is the first time that the Hawks landed on Earth, and they were never here in World War. You know what I mean? Like, they added all those continuity things. But standalone Hawkworld is dope. It is really, really great. Uh, I read it a ton when I was a kid. I reread it recently. I think it totally holds up. It's all about class warfare, uh, as above, so below. Um, the art is gorgeous. The 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 way he restylized the Hawks as you know, like these um, more down to earth policemen. You know, like they they really did some cool. They they added a lot to the mythos that still survives to this day. Uh, it's it's great. Like Hawk World is awesome. If you've never read it get your hands on it. I absolutely know that they've, they've, they've made that this one available. The Sears itself is also really good, but it, it becomes really problematic continuity wise. Um, but the Hawk world mini series, which is what we're talking about is just, just dynamite, man. Absolutely. Just dynamite. Let's see. What else do we have here today? Sandman is up to issue number eight. Oh, here we go. Star Trek five, the final frontier. So this is apparently, this is the month they're getting all their uh, summer movie adaptations out the door. Uh, that's always exciting. I do like me a good movie adaptation. I always thought like DC, and I feel like it works really well with DC, not so much Marvel. I don't know why. Well, because DC always had Elseworlds and stuff. The, when DC would do like the like the gimmick months, you know, they they should do like uh, 
they should do like a DC goes to the movies month and just reach out to random. And now you, you wouldn't do it actually, because they're actually making movies for this stuff. This is, I had this idea years ago before they were actually making DC movies, but like give, give creators, uh, kind of carte block and say, if you were realistically making a movie out of whatever, whatever character, how would you do it? What would your movie take on this be? And I have a feeling a lot of people wouldn't do that because they are trying to sell to Hollywood. So probably wouldn't fly too much, but I would love to see that. Like, like DC goes in movies, continuity free. What's your fresh take on, on, on how this would work? And, you know, tr- try to style it like with movie budgets and movie limitations and things like that. I don't know. Maybe that's that's just me because I do have a soft spot for the movie adaptations of books, which usually are not that good of books <laughs> because they're trying to adapt a smaller medium. The smaller medium being films. Uh, films are absolutely smaller than comics because comics have unlimited budgets. You can do you can blow up galaxies in comic books and and on movies that all cost a lot of money to you. Anyway, so yeah, so that's it for DC Comics. Let's move on to Marvel. You were saying and Marvel. Cover date of August 89, shelf date April 89. What do we have here? Spider-Man 318, more McFarlane fun. He's fighting um, Scorpion. Avengers Spotlight featuring Hawkeye in the lead. And it looks like, is that Namor? No, I'm sorry, Star Fox. Star Fox, uh, obviously the creepiest of all Avengers uh, whose basic power is, uh, is is a roofie. That's what Star Fox does. Star Fox roofies anyone he fights, and that's not even that's really not even hyperbole. It's it's not much of a joke. That's actually Star Fox's fire. So uh, good times. Um, oh, Iron Man Annual Ten. I think this either it's this one was this the start of it, or maybe it was maybe it was Silver Surfer. It was one. It was one. Well, obviously it's this month, so it's one of these early ones. Uh, but this month is the start of Atlantis Attacks. And this was the, uh, the the big crossover that ran in the annuals. This is where I was like, this is the annuals where I think they should do, like DC goes to the movies or Marvel goes to the movies. Um, but yeah, Atlantis Attacks. And this was um, basically all of Submariner's lieutenants got together and said, we should just kick him out and take over, um, uh, take over uh, everything. And it had to do with the Serpent Crown and... Uh, Big blue Atuma, Serpent Crown, and uh, they had to sacrifice seven brides, and the brides ended up being, you know, like She Hulk, Jean Grey, Invisible Woman. They're all on the cover, surrounded by, like, uh, surrounding the Serpent Crown at some point in these. Uh, And it was a good, it was a really well coordinated crossover. Um, And it was great because it started small, you know, and then it built bigger and bigger. And then they also had these uh, backups in it like four or five, six page backups of like the history of the serpent crown that were fresh images and fresh, freshly told stories. But it traced the serpent crown throughout the multiverse of Marvel, you know, because it like, it was at some point in um, the uh, 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 squadron Supremes universe. And then it was here. And then it was at project Pegasus. And it was, sometimes it was shaped like serpents. Sometimes it was shaped like, you know, a, a giant gold crown you know, like like all that stuff, and and they did a good job with reconciling all those different versions of the serpent uh, crown. So that's fun. Um, so that starts. It's in this month in uh, Iron Man Annual Ten and uh, Silver Surfer Annual. And what is there any other annual this month? That, that oh, in uh, the X Men Annual too. The X Men X Men Annual Thirteen. So that all starts this month now. Uh, Marvel Fanfare number 45. This, I think this was the first issue of Marvel Fanfare I got when I was a kid. And it's because it's got this gorgeous John Byrne cover. Absolutely zero backgrounds on it. But he he solves it by kicking up the angle, putting it, putting it in a real high angle shot, and um, just gorgeously drawing everybody. And it's it's because the book itself is a series of pinups. It's not actually a story. It's just a bunch of pinups on the inside. Uh, he's got you know um, Scarlet Witch and Captain America, Wolverine, Namor, Spider Man, Colossus, uh, old Iron Man, young Iron Man, or newish Iron Man, Kitty Pride's phasing through this invisible white floor, and then it's Burn as the photographer. Or is actually I don't think that's supposed to be Burn. I think that's Al. Yeah, that's Al Milgram as the photographer, drawn by Burn. Oh, and Silver Surfer's on there. And uh, and if you look closely, Superman's leaving the scene. There's a red boot with a red cape. That's absolutely Superman. Um, 
Is someone's at the bottom. Is that is that Black Panther? Yeah, that's Black Panther at the bottom. And it's a double wrapper. Like this was this was me getting early into comics. And so like this this concept of, of an opportunity to to like partake in the larger Marvel universe. Actually, frankly, like the invitation of Atlantis Attacks and also a book like this where you just get to see a lot of these cool pictures of these cool characters. A lot of them at the time, I didn't know who they were. Um, it was pretty neat. I remember really, really enjoying that issue. Uh, and some of the illustrations are, are absolutely gorgeous. Here we go with Nth Man number one. This is Larry Hama's other book at the time. Um, and Nth Man, the ultimate ninja, takes place on a, you know, it's not in, a, it's not in the Marvel Universe proper. It's like an alternate Earth. I think I have maybe half of these issues or something like that. Um, I never really put together a full set of it. And because it was a ninja, I was really, really confused at the time as a kid because obviously I knew ninjas and Larry Hama from G.I. Joe. So I was like, oh, is this a G.I. Joe crossover? And then when I learned that it wasn't a G.I. Joe crossover, my interest went to zero um, just because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't following artists or writers at the time. I was just like characters. Uh, so I remember, I absolutely remember being like, no, no, I don't know. I mean, how many ninjas can I deal with? I just, I like my snake eyes ninjas. So, um, yeah, but an nth man, the ultimate ninja is on the shelf. If I ever get to f- a full run of nth man together, maybe I'll do some special episodes on those, on those. Uh, I think I'm only missing a, a handful. I'll, I'll look into that, but th- that'd be a lot of fun. Cause of course, you know, it's, it's written really well over and uh, the Punisher UK number three. Man, I hope this cover is not misleading because now I know, so I know they, the UK stuff is usually reprints, right? So, uh, so I don't, and, and there's no description of what's inside of it, but it's the Punisher UK. So I'm sure they're reprinting some Punisher stuff and I'm assuming they're reprinting issues of this character I'm about to say, but man, do I just like the promise of a Punisher comic with on the front cover RoboCop? Stop it. A Punisher comic with RoboCop on the cover? That's awesome. I'm here for that. Uh, so, And it's from the Punisher UK reprints. Uh, I have a strong, strong feeling. Oh, and when you look back, actually, so that's issue three, and they were, UK, they did like weekly books, and they were thinner. You guys know this from the G.I. Joe UK stuff. Um, so it looks like it is, the Punisher is backup. So it's they're not doing new Punisher crossovers with RoboCop, but holy cow, to see it on the cover... Gotta say, pretty cool. Just throwing that out there. Pretty freaking cool. What else do we got here? Um, Thor is returning to Wondergore Mountain. Uh, the X Men, X Men 247. Uh, oh, real quick, two two quick books. Wolverine 10. It's Wolverine versus Sabretooth. This is like their second big fight that they ever did. This is a, this is another good book to to get for back issues. You ever see this? Uh, it's got saber tooth, uh, punching Wolverine and they're in the, or like he's holding his face down. They're in the snow. Wolverine's shirtless. Um, what's two things that are great about this one. It is their second fight. The first one, or maybe third, let me think. So they fought in mutant massacre and then they would have fought in, uh, the early two twenties. So maybe this is like their third fight, but what this issue really is, is it's the first time that it showed that they had an old history. Cause this is, um, Sabretooth shows up on Wolverine's birthday and he talks about how he shows up on every birthday, wherever Wolverine is the war is in the world. Wolverine Sabretooth finds him on his birthday and he murders the woman Wolverine's with. <laughs> and and it, this was huge because we didn't have a lot of information on Wolverine's history at the time. Uh, believe it or not, it was, he was still very much a mystery man. Um, and so this story just fleshed out so much details of it. It's such a great issue. Uh, you absolutely, absolutely seek this book out, and so it's it it, it is hiking up on the on the back issues. The other cool book is uh, Wolverine and Nick Fury: The Scorpio Connection. Uh, Howard Chaykin, and uh, who uh, who who wrote that? Who wrote that? Oh, uh, oh, Archie Goodwin. No wonder it's so good. Yeah, I didn't realize Archie Goodwin wrote that. Archie Goodwin wrote it. Howard Chaykin drew it, uh, and it's Wolverine and Nick Fury teaming up to take down Scorpio, which Scorpio, I believe at that time was, it was either Nick Fury's kid or his brother. I feel like it was his brother, but it might've been his son. I think, I feel like it was both at at different times. Um, but it's like a, it's like a world globe trotting spy adventure. 
and it's really good. And if you, Archie Goodwin's one of those names that uh, a lot of comic, a lot of modern comic readers don't know, and that's not—I don't mean that as a slam, because he was quietly one of the greatest writers of all comics. Uh, but he was also prim- he was a huge editor. He edited some of the the best comic books in the history of stuff, and he collaborated with just the best creators. And people had nothing but great things to say about him. Uh, and he passed in the mid '90s. He, I think his his last really his last big project book that he like launched and and shepherded was Starman. Um, but he worked with Simonson on Manhunter. He you know he wrote Manhunter with Simonson, um, and he he wrote the uh, the Star Wars comic strip. And, and like the adaptations of the movies, uh, Archie Goodwin's absolutely a phenomenal, phenomenal storyteller. So if you get your hands on the Wolverine, Nick Fury, Scorpio connection, tra- uh, graphic novel, you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, and then in X-Men 247, uh, it's the X-Men go into the siege perilous, which, uh, was a giant gem that judged you based on how your worth and how good you were in your life. And it would reincarnate you. And this was huge. This was, um, this was, this was, this was like a big way for the X Men to get a fresh start, and they get scattered to the four winds of the world, uh, and uh, it's 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 what eventually leads us to get Gambit, and um, uh, let's see, Colossus becomes a painter. Um, it's how it's how it's, it's explained how Psylocke becomes Japanese. Like there was a lot that happens from this Siege Perilous. So this is a this is a cool little issue. And so you were saying we're gonna move on to the films now. Now remember, if you're listening, stay tuned to the end of this episode where we got a big Snake Eyes giveaway. Tease, tease, tease. In April 1989, on April 7th, Cyborg with Jean-Claude Van Damme. What? That's not enough. Dead Calm with Sam Neill, Nicole Kidman, and Billy Zane. That movie's crazy good. Also, funny, uh, kind of a charming, funny movie. Uh, Speaking of Batman, Batman 89, The Dream Team. With Michael Keaton, Christopher Lloyd, Peter Boyle, and Stephen First. Uh, that movie is underratedly funny. And the best argument for allowing swear words in in films, and I say allowing, like when their films are shown on TV, this movie is not as funny when they bleep out the swears. Is absolutely a funnier movie with all the swears because they're perfectly used. The movie Major League absolutely slams at home. When you ha- when you're allowed to just use all the cuss words in the right places because it's Major League is an absolute classic. Now on April 14th, let's get romantic with Say Anything, Cameron Crowe's movie with John Cusack and his radio. Ioni Sky, John Mahoney, Lily Taylor. Uh, this movie's uh, fantastic. And uh, we've also got on, on April 20th, Kickboxer with John Claude Van Damme. John Claude Van Damme had Cyborg and Kickboxer open within two weeks of each other. What is happening? Who is figuring that out? So Kickboxer was from Canon Films, and Cyborg, Cyborg's also from Canon. So the Canon Group and Canon Films, I wonder if those are different. The Canon Group, the Canon Group. No, Canon, what are you doing? You've got John claude I guess maybe if they're just saturating, maybe they're just saying, hey, world, guess what? Kickboxer and Cyborg are here to uh, just make your life absolutely better. April 21st, Field of Dreams. Speaking of, was Field of Dreams. Oh, that's wild. Field of Dreams and Major League, same month. That is, that's crazy. Pet Cemetery, the original Pet Cemetery. That's fantastic. Um, what else? Oh, Dolph Lundgren and Red Scorpion. And here, this is a classic for uh, some of you youngsters out there. Uh, they, they, this, this movie recently got a big resurge in um, nostalgia. Teen Witch. With um, uh, Robin Liley and Zelda, Zelda Rubenstein, and uh, the, the, the where they sing that the what's that rap in the middle like about top that what's that yeah top that that's the song um, yeah that movie's not great but it's like one of those nostalgically great movies um, then on twenty eighth April twenty eighth <laughs> Jim Belushi's Canine. Uh, <laughs> And um, this is a movie I saw a ton on HBO when I was a kid. Uh, Lover Boy with uh, Patrick Dempsey as a pizza delivering Lothario, basically a call girl, call guy service, and Kirstie Alley, Carrie Fisher, Kate Jackson. Uh, and they were uh, 
you know, like local board housewives who would call for pizza, order pizza with, I forget what that was, it was like extra, extra anchovies. I think I feel like that was the order. And, um, and then that would be the clue that Patrick Dempsey would go over there and, um, uh, be an escort to, to the ladies. So yeah, lover boy, but that's wild, man. Two huge Van Damme movies in the same month, field of dreams, same month as major league. That's awesome. So that's it for you were saying. And now let's get on with G.I. Joe 89. Now mass is ready. Cover by Mark Bright and Bob McLeod. Now, um, this cover is undercut by the colors. I don't like it. They, um, they, the base of, um, the mean dog with, um, wild card and repeat, or, or I'm sorry, wild card and, um, hardball, the base, like the, the body of the vehicle is colored pretty much the same color as the background behind wild card, um, which gives it this weird, floating in the void sense even though there's drawn details on the base of of the mean dog it um it just it i wish they had colored the actual you know like the body like the vehicle body the proper color to make it not just blend in with this orangey reddish orange background that they put i feel like that would have just it would bring this this issue home as a drawing, it's great. It's got uh, it's got an almost three D element to it. You know the um, the the main cannon is is just in your face. Got nice perspective on it. Wild card is you know screaming and shouting his fist. They, I, everyone looks great on this. I think it's really really let down by the color choices. Part of me wonders if that if that's partially a mistake. Um, like I'm, I I don't know. It just feels like a really weird choice to go with this almost the exact same background color. But it does continue the um, the tradition of doing like these um, like spotlight covers of, of no real backgrounds, but just like an image uh, of the guys in the book. So, Yo, Joe! now it's Mean Dog with an exclamation mark. Script by Larry Hama, pencils Mark Bright, M. D. Bright, Randy Emberlin inks, Rick Parker letters, Bob Sharon colors, Bobby Chase editor, Tam DeFalco editor in chief. Before we get into it. We've got an ad for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Turn your house into a sewer from Ultra Games. This was the NES TMNT game. I played this a ton. I think I played this at Tony Kohler's house. Um, I don't think I owned it, but I did play this a lot. This was a lot of fun. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles had some early, fun, good video games. Like, there's there's a lot of good video game memories around Turtles for... uh, for a lot of listeners out there, I know you guys have them. So the book itself opens with uh, Buzzer swimming Scrooge McDuck style in a giant swimming pool. Uh, there, quote, in the fabulous Broca Beach on the scintillating Jersey Shore. Uh, and he is swimming and he's throwing money in the air, and the whole swimming pool is full of money. Uh, behind him, um, you've got uh, Thrasher and Road Pig with shovels, presumably shoveling the money in there, uh, which is hilarious. And it's our first real glimpse at Mark Bright's work on G.I. Joe, and uh, I'm here for it, man. I'm here for his level of realism and detail. I love it. And, you know, Buzzer is also loving all this money. Yo, Joe! This money was not stolen, however. It was diverted from investments, and that's important. So we get our first look at Zorana. I am here to say I adore bright's rendition of zorana a lot because he focuses on the mullet he never begrudges her mullet and for my money he doesn't make her look like a beauty queen she looks like a biker you know like like i just i've always and maybe it's because bright's renditions might have been you know like my i was reading the book by then i don't know why i don't know i don't know why bright's rendition of zorana always sticks with me but I really like it. So she's correcting these guys that all this money is, um, you know, from quote unquote real investments. This is, you know, this is Cobra. This is uh, Godfather Part Two. They're trying to make themselves legitimate. You know, this is Cobra trying to legitimize themselves. 
Uh, and there's a lot of fun road pig uh, stuff in here where he flips from um, his two personalities, you know. And he, of course, he cracks Buzzer on the head with his uh, with his shovel. Uh, and we see that uh, Zorana's reading Forbes. So she's really taking a uh, serious interest in bettering herself as she goes for a stroll on the boardwalk. Now, this is nice. Um, there's nice storytelling on this page. You've got um, you know, where we open on uh, Buzzer in the Pool. Get just a nice regular uh, medium shot. Uh, we still see Buzzer in the Pool, so that places you... It places kind of where everything's at when they show Zorana poolside. And then we zoom in on Buzzer as he has some action, some things to say, getting hit by the by the thing. And then it follows as Buzzer is kind of at the edge of the pool as the camera flips to see now Zorana walking out, which then takes us at the bottom panel outside of the boardwalk. So this is really like very much blocking and tackling in storytelling, right? So you... You can picture if this was like if this was one shot, there's just a sweeping kind of camera move that would be zooming in and following people, and then once the action with buzzer is gone, it kind of zooms away. It notices that that Zorana's on the move, and then it kind of follows her out. It's really cool, and we see outside on the boardwalk that um, all these all the Cobra, you know, like the residents of Broca Beach, you know, which are all you know Cobra families and stuff like that. It's 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 undergoing a big renovation, which at the time, on like Jersey Shore, Atlantic City stuff was undergoing a big uh, renovation. This was a big era of uh, renovation for the Jersey Shore, which had gone under a lot of disrepair. So we're seeing a lot of parallels with that here. Yo, Joe! Um, kids on skateboards. They're all. It's funny though. No one's really hiding the Cobra affiliation. <laughs> all these kids, <laughs> these kids have Cobra logos on their shirts. There's a poster. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be, to be fair. I don't know if it's supposed to be a wanted. It feels like it's a wanted poster, but it just says the words Cobra on it, and there's a dude in sunglasses. I'm not exactly sure who or what that's supposed to be, but I like it. Um, and then and then this is a fun bit of, of um, like, just a, just a fun detail to put in, that all of the shoreline amusement park rides are disguised cobra vehicles so that they can hide them in plain sight use them whenever they need them certainly they use them in this issue uh but you got like cobra pogos that are repainted you know and they're connected to ferris wheels or not ferris wheels uh one of one of those um carousels like the like the uh, the ferrets are on carousels and fang helicopters are attached to you know like the kind of the the spinning arm um carnival rides you know things that just go in a circle with the arms and go up and down so that's really fun i i enjoy that little gag and you also then get to see these pogos in like a wide variety of colors which is neat and it doesn't feel out of place um and probably the best thing they have here is uh the shooting gallery which actually has (laughs) gi joe targets it's got shipwreck and polly by the way huge props to mark bright for drawing polly uh, it's got Scarlet, Snake Eyes. Um, it's probably it's probably supposed to be Duke, to be honest. Um, but it's either Duke or Hawk with giant targets in the, on their sternums. And it looks like the guns are real guns, too. It's not even, you know, airsoft guns or anything. So uh, we're getting we're getting this little quick mini tour of what Cobra's up to. They are not, for all the subterfuge they're going to, to hide it, they're really not interested uh, in hiding it. But... What is great about this is Zorana really is giving us a glimpse, or Larry's giving us a glimpse of Zorana's genuine dreams of legitimacy. Like, she really thinks Cobra can actually make it. And and it gives us an insight into her character that she's, it's someone who's, you know, maybe she's not all about that criminal life, but she just, she's someone who doesn't like a lot of rules and wants to live outside the law, but at the same time, you know, takes some roots. Yo, Joe! Meanwhile, in the interstate just outside of Broca Beach, this whole episode is a huge callback to uh, one of those early issues where uh, Clutch and Rock and Roll are, are in there, are in the, uh, the, the, was it the Woody Wagon? And they have that big chase with Cobra uh, on the expressway. You guys remember that issue? That's what this, this whole issue is like a callback to that because we get Rock and Roll and we get Clutch. And let me just throw this out there. They're driving a, um, uh, what are they? Uh, is it a 
it's no, it's not Barracuda because that was a Barracuda last time. But they, they say what it is again. I'm a I'm a huge car guy, so it didn't burn into my head. But I'm just saying this clutch car you're driving is needs a lot of work, and I'm surprised to see clutch driving such a jacked up car. Um, but they are there to check out Broca Beach. Well, actually, they're there on they're on rest and relaxation. But they see that they've changed this name uh, to Broca Beach. And they also see that the town itself is getting cleaned up. Um, and Clutch says, you know, it's cleaned up so much it doesn't even look real anymore. Everything is too perfect, rock and roll. And rock and roll, you know, telling them that it's progress, Clutch. All the funky stuff he used to like about this berg. It was probably referred to as blight in other circles, you know. So they're 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 reminiscing on the loss of, of their youth. Uh, they miss the, the greasy burger stand. So you can't go home again. It's a nice, uh, it's a, it's a fun, it's a really fun setup here. And it's also driving home. These guys really are here just here on vacation. They're actually, they're not scoping it out for any other reason. Yo, Joe! And they get to the boardwalk and they see that, uh, uh, or as they pull up rather, uh, a cop drives right up and is, and gives them, starts giving them the business. And what's fun about this is they don't, they really don't waste any time. Like they're immediately getting run out as drifters, and and there's nothing I love more than a good, let's run a drifter out of town story, and that's also what we're getting here. As the cop says, uh, we don't care for no account drifters in this town, do we, Damon? And he says, that's right, Pythias. Now, Damon and Pythias. If those names sound familiar, they should. They did sound familiar to me, so, and I was like, all right, I know this is a reference I need to catch, uh, and sure enough. It's from the Greek story, uh, Greek historic writings, where uh, uh, about the Pythagorean Pythagorean ideal of friendship. Pythias is accused of and charged with plotting against the tyrannical Dionysus. Now, Pythias requests uh, of Dionysus that he's allowed to settle his affairs, and Dionysus agrees on the condition that his friend Damon be held hostage, and should Pythias not return. Damon would be executed in Pythias' stead. When Pythias returns, Dionysus, who is absolutely amazed by the love and trust in the friendship of these two dudes, he frees them both. So, uh, this is like, this is two dudes who have moral friendship and security, like great friendship, and they do anything for each other. Why that is layered on two random cops and broke a beach, I don't know, but I'm here for it. These two cops are best friends. Let's get a follow-up story on Damon and Pythias from Bro- Broca Beach and how their friendship had to save the day because they trusted each other so much. But they also forgot to take off their Cobra ring, which Rock and Roll notices immediately. And when he does, he grabs Clutch, who Clutch is starting to lose his, his, lose his uh, temper. Because the Joes didn't do anything, they pulled up in a you know they pulled up in a beat up car and and they get told to you know go beat feet. So Clutch is like, do you know who we are? And he's about to say they're GI Joe, but Rock and Roll is like, yeah. So Damon and Pythias of Greek lore, welcome to GI Joe. Yo Joe! Uh, before we go further, just so you know, uh, video games just got easier to order. You can call the toll free Sears catalog Nintendo number. And order up your NES game. You guys, call Sears right now. And you can get a Nintendo Action Set for only $100. The Action Set came with an NES, two controllers, a light gun, and Mario and Duck Hunt combo pack. That is, the Action Set is exactly the set that I had growing up. You could also buy Blades of Steel for 40 bucks. I had Blades of Steel as my favorite hockey game. You could buy Super Mario Bros. 2. For $43, Zelda 2 Adventures of Link for $45, uh, Bionic Commando, $39 or $40. Bucks. What else do we got? Oh, oh, you get the Friday the 13th game, guys, $40. Bucks. Spy Hunter, $32. Superman, the NES game, I had that, played the hell out of it, $40. I still have my Superman game. WrestleMania for the NES, that was game was great. 43 bucks rbi baseball the greatest baseball game of all time 43 dollars. call the sears catalog right now they're waiting for your order while we're on that topic any gamers keep listening to the show i'm just saying 
by the time we get to this end, there may be a giveaway you may like. Now, um, I am amazed that games are 40, 45, 40 bucks, 45 bucks, and they're still between 40 and 50, 60 bucks. It is crazy how those prices have stayed relatively flat over these years. It is wild. And the system has gone from $100 to $500 or more. Wild. So meanwhile, back at the amphitheater, um, I love this. Road Pig has just not stopped beating on Buzzer with that shovel. Like he is still hitting him in the head. He constantly hitting him in the head. So much so the Buzzer uh, bops his head into the fence. And he, um, uh, he as he hits the fence, oh, they're, they're in a 74 Barracuda. That's what they're driving. Uh, they notice that that the Barracuda uh, is is driving by. And then he he recognizes the Joes for who they are, uh, and Road Pig gets involved. Of course, he just punches an, a fresh hole in the sense and in the fence, and he's he says those two wimps was Joes, and then he, he starts screaming at them, and the scream <laughs> is uh, is apparently loud enough to get uh, Clutch and Rock and Roll's attention as they drive away. Um, and rock and roll is just telling clutch to just keep driving. Don't look back. So the Joes are making their way out of town. Yo, Joe! Now, Damon and Pythias are getting yelled at by road pig. Uh, and road pig says, don't just stand there like a pair of hydrocephalic precambrian invertebrates. And then he flips into his other personality. So go, 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 go get those J J J Joes. Um, they'll do that throughout this issue where he'll flip from his, his smart one to his dumb one. Uh, and it's great. And it's really on a dime and it's fabulous. Um, so the cops are off after him. They tell Zorana that it's, they got to go after him. And this, this picture of Zorana is kind of what I'm saying where like, she's not a beauty queen, but she don't run from it. Like she don't run from the fact that she's got a mullet and I'm here to rock it. And I'm, I'm just, I'm here to be Zorana. Um, it's great. So she tells everybody, you know, basically all hands on deck. Cause if they get out everything that they're, um, you know, they're working for and building for here is, is going to go away. So they jump on all of these disguised vehicles that they just finished hooking up. Um, so we've got some really funky looking, um, you know, dreadnought trikes and ferrets and pogos, uh, with a lot of different designs on them. They look pretty great. Yo, Joe! And the cops are just, well, and the Dreadnoughts now are caught up to him too, but the cops are shooting at um, Rock and they're shooting at the Barracuda, shooting at Rock and Roll and, um, and Clutch. The other thing I'm surprised in this, in this page is that Clutch keeps a messy car. Now, he's got a hockey stick in the back. He's got a basketball. That's fun. Um, but he keeps a messy car. I feel, like, I feel like Clutch wouldn't keep a messy car. I feel like Clutch would have more respect for his car. Uh, he just, the only thing he does keep in his glove compartment are gloves. That's a fun joke. Uh, and Rock and Roll is looking for the radio to call the Joes. That's why we see this. So then Rock and Roll uses all the garbage that's in the back seat. He just starts throwing that garbage at the Cobras because they don't have any weapons, really. I'm sure they probably, I think, do they come up with pistols later? They really don't have weapons. So it's just they got to get away from all this stuff. Um, but I, this um, Bright's art in this is just great, man. It's just solid. It's really solid storytelling. You know, he starts with a medium shot of them in the car, and then he pulls back to show us, give us perspective of where they're at. They're on the highway along the coast. Um, you know, and then he zooms back into the car. She gives us the gag about the gloves and the garbage. And then he and then he puts the camera. This is important. Then he puts the camera at the rear of the chase um, and going exactly at our um, vanishing, uh, like our vanishing point, right? So... That gives this sense of movement, pursuit, and finality to this part of the adventure. So this page just has this closure to it, uh, and that's it's really it's really a very subtle, very good, very smart move artistically, because it it just moves. I mean, especially in the top, we're kind of we're pacing with them in the top panel. We're ahead of them in the second panel. We're with them in the middle, and then at the bottom we see tail lights of of the pursuers and the Joes. But putting us in the taillights means they're going fast, they're going away, and then we're, we're about to move on to a different uh, perspective on the story. Yo, Joe! Uh, and, of course, that different perspective is in Broca Beach, where we get some fangs and hisses are being deployed. And it looks, what you could tell from this, and I like that they're doing this, um, they're doing this via imagery, and they're not telling us this, but they're parking hisses in every, you know, it's like a 
it's like an old campaign slogan. You know, you're getting a hiss in every driveway, you know, and, and Cobra soup in every pot. Like every house is getting a hiss tank delivered to it. They don't call it out. I mean, they say Fang and Hiss deployment underway, but they're, um, they're, you can see that they're, all right, oh, no, wait a minute. Is that what's happening here? Okay, so I take that all back. I'm sorry. Even better, they're actually leaving the house. They're going onto the truck because they're going to join this chase. Pardon me for misreading that. I was misinterpreting that. But it does show you that every house has a his tank, and that's great. Second shot, we get all the pogos. They're all launching across town. Uh, and then the dreadnoughts are, are, are getting ready to, to take off. Um, and Zorana is the one that absolutely knows how important this is that they don't screw this up. Yo, Joe! Um, Monkey Wrench is in pursuit. Monkey Wrench has a, um, looks like a televiper with him. Uh, and uh, he's on a ferret, and he's he's the only Dreadnought that is keeping pace with um, <laughs> Damon and Pythias um, as they as they chase the Joes. Now, uh, Ro- Rock and Roll found the radio, and they're they're trying to call the Joes. They're trying to they're you know they're just calling for help again. They don't have any guns. All they got is their lead foot and a beat up car. Um, the Televiper is able to jam the frequency. And then Damon and Orpithius uh, is shooting pa- quarter panels off the side of the Barracuda. Um, so these guys really are in trouble. They do a nice job of, of really putting these two Joes in peril. And it it, it comes up next issue. Like it, this, this isn't just a one-off adventure. This is a fun start to a good one. Yo, Joe! So uh, according to the sign, they are... They're at an intersection uh, near the Jersey Turnpike, and this is a um, a transport like freight truck. And um, it's let's see, it's Scarlet driving, and uh, and I'm not sure. I think that's I think that's supposed to be Hawk, but it's also got a Duke flair to it. And to be honest, on this page. They actually don't identify who that is. And remember, the problem being. Hawk and Duke are drawn very similar. Uh, and he's, his shirt's colored green, uh, but it's also got like a bandolier like Hawk wears. So we're going to find out. I'm sure they were, I'm sure they call him up by name later in this issue and I'm just missing it. So we're just going to just, we're going to read this. We're going to go through this now. Like as we're reading it, uh, Scarlet isn't, doesn't name check him. And, uh, yeah. So uh, they, they, they call for the mean dog to uh, to deploy. And so we get our we get, we get a shot of the mean dog with Wildcard. And remember, Wildcard breaks everything. Uh, so again, the, the, the restraining straps that were on, that were keeping the mean dog in place, uh, they were broken the minute Wildcard touched them. Yo, Joe! And uh, <laughs> this is fun because as the mean dog rolls off the truck, they just crash in other cars. Um, it's great. And someone says, well, watch out. We almost got hit. And they say, you know, this thing can take a direct hit from 120 Mike, Mike discarding Sabo high explosive anti-tank round. You know, I'm not breaking a sweat about being bumped by a Hyundai. Um, and then in a, in a little bit, I think it's uh, I think it's hardball. that says any vehicle that could survive wild card is stronger than he's like, what'd you say? And he just cuts him off. Uh, that's great. Um, and, and, wild card is like uh just he doesn't need a road like roads we don't need roads and he just cuts across the farm fields of, of jersey heading towards the heading towards the shore this is um this is a lot of fun and it what's fun about this is it shows personality on wild card it shows personality on hardball it shows the capabilities of the mean dog as a toy like it can just go wherever it wants to go because that's how bad it is um i like it a lot yo joe now, Clutch, uh, Clutch is upset that they're destroying his ride because he's definitely this is definitely a rebuild, and so that explains why it's in such bad shape. But man, Clutch, you should be ashamed to be driving this car. Like I would think this car should still be in the garage, re- being rebuilt. It's not yet street ready. It's just not. Uh, even Rock and Roll says the ride is appreciably better with all those parts missing. Uh, and Clutch defends it. Like I know. No, this isn't, this is, you're not, this, it's a, the Barracuda is a classic, but this is not, you're, you're not, you're not in a good car clutch. Uh, but as they do, as they, you know, turn some corners, they're, they're confronted by the dreadnoughts. 
So the Barracuda has to kind of go off road here. Um, so now it's like a uh, now it's like a dirt country road chase, and it's great. We've got like a pink, a yellow, a green Cobra Fang pursuing them. All the vehicles the Dreadnoughts are in are in multicolor. Like there's some great color. It's funny for for the coloring issue we identified on the front cover. It makes up for it with some dynamic coloring choices on the inside. Story driven dynamic coloring choices. I think that's really really great. Yo, Joe. And as they kind of crest a, a farm ridge or so to speak, the mean dog makes its appearance and just sh- shoots down those fangs, just knocks them out of the sky. Um, that's great. Uh, the None of the Dreadnoughts vehicles, they don't have any armor piercing stuff, so the mean dog's not in any trouble. Um, the Barracuda flies past the mean dog. They don't have time to tell them what's up, just that they're being pursued by Cobra. They don't have, to, they don't have time to say, hey, this town a few miles back, it's all Cobra. So, um, what I like here is Z- Zarena still know- knows this. She knows that their information is still with them. The The radio was, was, um, was blocked. She's fairly confident they haven't gotten the word out. Um, so they still have the opportunity to, ch- to chase them and they're not being, uh, they're not being persuaded to stop by the mean dog. Yo, Joe! Now on Blacktop, Chuck, uh, Chuck. Clutch, Chuck. This is the new G.I. Joe driver, Chuck. Hey, Chuck. Um, the mean dog's going to uh, buy them some time to get away because they know that even these small arms will just destroy that Barracuda. Uh, so or, this is fun. Wildcard breaks the gear shift or, or some lever, some important controlling lever on the main dog. It just snaps off in his hand. Um, and he lies about it. That's great. And uh, with this, Clutch is so eager to get in the game. He's like, maybe we should turn back and give Wildcard and the others a hand. And roadblock, uh, roadblock, rock and roll, rather, throws a, a can of Valvoline motor oil on him. Are you nuts? We don't even have a loaded spitball. You know, we got to make tracks. Yo, Joe! Now, the mean dog is just, it's fight. It's one mean dog is taking on one, two, three, his, four his tanks. Uh, there's a ferret in the mix. Um, hardball and repeater are just are, are doing their jobs. They're, they're, they're doing a really good job here. Wildcards, it, it's, it does its job. It's great. Um, but, uh, buzzer, uh, in the, in the dreadnought trike is, uh, is, is going the other way. Like he's, he knows they're outgunned and outmatched. Yo, Joe! And, uh, so all this off-road pursuit has allowed Damon and Pythias, our favorite cops to kind of circle around in front of them. And they're able to block, uh, block the release, the release date lanes guys. So, um, and they have pistols and those pistols obviously are, um, uh, not great for the, um, for the unshielded Barracuda. Let's put it that way. So, um, uh, so the car spins out and, uh, it's going to hit the cops Yo, Joe! and the cops do what the cops do in most of these great, um, chase 80s chase movies they drive off the road and there's big cop car pileups um very uh, blues brothers-esque as the car is spinning around in the middle uh and then it writes itself and it takes off down the highway with a bunch of pogos in pursuit Yo, Joe! and there's some just overall there's just good panel to panel storytelling here of keeping us aware and, and like situational awareness of who's in who's in front of what where other cars are you know, who's in the lead, who's in the what, all that stuff. Um, Zanzibar gets in the mix. He's, you know, instructing all these pogos just to fire all their missiles at the mean dog. Um, we get some nice explosions on this bottom panel here. Yo, Joe! And, of course, Zanzibar being Zanzibar, he's always wrong. He thinks that was enough. And we get this amazing panel with just every sound effect of every explosion or mechanical noise you could think of with everything firing off the, the still standing mean dog, garunk, clunk, wonk, gung, gung, broom, whoosh, whoosh, and rat a tat tat. And they just take down all these pogos. Like every pogo goes down. All their weapons are dry. They used, they used everything they had and, and they won the day. Yo, Joe! Or did they win the day? Because, uh, Zanzibar still in a quasi active pogo. Remember pogos have three legs and they jump up in the sky. One of his legs got blown off. So he's 
hobbling away in this two-legged pogo. And uh, Wildcard decides to just run it over because they're all out of guns or all out of ammo. He just runs it over with the mean dog and they grab uh, Zanzibar and they, they pull him on board. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a real fun, just uh, you're coming with us kind of a moment. Remember Zanzibar was in jail uh, the last time we saw Road Pig. Remember when Road Pig first showed up and broke Zoran out of jail? Zanzibar also in jail. So Zanzibar likes getting caught. Yo, Joe! Or rather, we should say Larry likes getting Zanzibar caught. So now uh, we think th the trouble is over. Uh, the guys in the CUDA, they're leaving the cops behind. They're on the move. And just when they get that far, the Barracuda has absolutely had enough. Or has it? No, it hit a brick wall. That brick wall's name is Road Pig. And Road Pig put his cinder block right through the front engine, bringing the Barracuda to a complete stop. And he is here to kidnap the Joes. And you see in, in, in the post box, the pit page next month, it's it's that uh, fun, great cover with Road Pig hauling uh, rock and roll and clutch like into the jail. Um, and I does it say, uh, yeah, brainwave scanner this way arrow. So the story is not over. This is not just a one and done and fun thing. The story is uh, is is continuing, and I'm here for it. That was a whole lot of fun. Um, before we get into the post box, the pit stuff. Uh, I want a quick shout out to uh, Patreon, uh, Andy Johnson. Thank you for that awesome letter from last week. Uh, he gave us a lot of things. One of them being the pronunciation of of, of uh, Wukluk Land, and and actually it's from a future comic book. They actually have Destro doing it, and I forget what issue this is from, but uh, it's uh, I was having trouble mispronouncing it, and it's called Volkukukland, and it means Cloud Cuckoo Land, which Reference from Dave Amiot, friend of the show. Dave said that that's a reference from a... Let's go here. Dave said that's a reference from uh, the ancient Greek comedy, The Birds, by Aristophanes. Which is funny then that he's also using... So apparently, I'm throwing out there that Larry was doing a lot of like Greek history at the time and reading up on a lot of it. Because we got the Damon and Pythia stuff here. We got the Volkuka clan... I'm always going to mispronounce that. And um, I love it. And the other fun thing that Andy, our friend Andy wrote, uh, was that he had spinges. We have someone that had worked. He had spinges when he was a kid. He says uh, they were kind of cool. You wound them up, then they launch them like a top, but they were just mostly metal, sturdy little metal things, and they would spin and clank. And whoever was the last man standing won the spinges. So the answer to what how were spinges played with last week has been answered. So Andy, thank you so much. You get our uh, our answering prize for the week. And remember, you can always hear this show a little bit early on Patreon. Uh, today it's going to be a full day early. And uh, over here in the letters columns, we've got letters from uh, JJ Street out of Elliot. Uh, Maine we've got a letter <laughs> we've got a letter here from the enforcer out of Clareton Pennsylvania doesn't give his name he just says his name is the enforcer there you go uh, we also have a letter here from Joyce Macon out of Bellmead New Jersey uh, and Joyce has a theory that uh, Billy's mother is actually the Baroness in disguise. Joyce, you were wrong. But that was exciting. It's a, it's a fun theory, though. I kind of like it. I wish I wish they played with that a little more. Um, we also have a letter from Ted Plansom in Yorkton, Sask, Canada. So any, if, if any of you are out there, if any listeners are out there, and you hear your name, reach out. So be like, that was my letter. I, I read that. Now, normally this is the time when we say goodbye, but guys, we've teased it enough. I've Thank you for listening, first of all. Thank you for all you listeners for all this time. We really appreciate it. And I'm really happy here. I want to shout a big thanks to Golden Apple Comic Books because Golden Apple Comic Books is, is making this happen. I have three pairs of tickets for the Hollywood premiere of Snake Eyes. To give away to you, my loyal Joe on Joe listeners. Now, we've got a few caveats. 
listeners. This is a Los Angeles based event. So you absolutely need to be uh, able to make it. It's in LA and it's on Wednesday, July 21st, 7 p.m. If you cannot be in Los Angeles at 7 p.m., please keep listening because I do have some giveaways for you, but that's what this initial giveaway is for. Um, it is for the premiere and it's going to be great and I'm going to be there and we're going to meet and we're going to hang out. And it's going to be awesome. Um, I need everybody to follow Golden Apple Comics on uh, Instagram and stuff because Golden Apple is also going to have some uh, other giveaway stuff. That's also going to be local. It's going to be in the store giveaway stuff. So that uh, the details on that are, are forthcoming. But follow them on social, and they'll start tweeting it out when, when we get a little closer to it. That That's kind of dependent on when they actually get the physical items. But, you know, stuff like – usually it's stuff like pins and, you know, giveaway kind of stuff. Um, but if you can make the screening – on Wednesday, July 21st, 7 p.m. in Hollywood, you and you can be there. I want you to send an email to me at joeonjoepod at gmail.com. Now, the first three emails that I get which can properly answer this question will win a pair of tickets. Now, the question is, and i got to be in L.A., the question is, what is the hashtag that this show, Joe on Joe Podcast, what hashtag did we absolutely push last year? Really pushed it. You would say that we pushed it extremely hard all last year. What is that hashtag? And that is to make sure that we got some loyal listeners. I really want to try to reward loyal listeners with this. And if you're in LA and if you know the hashtag that we really extremely pushed really hard, you can figure it out. Let me know. And I want you guys to come join me for the Wednesday, July 21st screening of snake eyes. Uh, I'm so excited for this. And the first three emails I get with that answer, you, each of you will win a pair of tickets to the screening. I will email you the actual details of the screening, but it's Wednesday, July 1st, 7 PM in Los Angeles. Now, many of you are not in the Los Angeles area. I get that understood. So I did not want you guys to feel left out for anyone else. Now, this is actually open for non-Angelinos. It's open for Angelinos. But everybody else with an earshot, if you're listening, I have two goodies. This is out of my own personal goodie stash. So this was uh, this was me saying, let's let's just make this bigger. You know, I want a reward because you guys are great. And I love the show and I love doing it so much. And I love hearing from you guys. The first listener to email me at joeonjoepod at gmail.com with the word PlayStation. In the subject line of your email, you will win a copy of G.I. Joe Operation Blackout for the PlayStation 4. Now, you have to have a PS4, and I will ship it. I'll ship it anywhere. Now, it's also, you got to have a PS4 that plays the U.S.-based stuff. You know what I mean? It's that kind of a thing. But if but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm going to get you guys a copy of Operation Blackout. If you haven't played it yet, it's fun. It's not, I don't love it, personally. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to shill for it. But it is a G.I. Joe video game, so let's get that out there. So if you guys... First person to email me, joeonjoepod at gmail.com with the word PlayStation in the subject line will win a copy of J. Joe Operation Blackout for the PS4. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, okay, well, I don't have a PlayStation. I don't live in Los Angeles. Joe, what else do you got for me? This is just for people who know how to read. If you're literate, if you can read, and if you can look at pictures, and because you lasted this long into this episode, you've listened this far into the episode, because you love snake eyes, I love snake eyes. The first person to email me at joeonjoepod at gmail.com with the word Fortnite in the subject line, you're going to win an unopened first print of Batman Fortnite zero point number three featuring our boy Snake Eyes. That is right, guys. A first print. Batman Fortnite, number three, unopened, still in the poly bag, so the code is still good. Uh, it's mint condition. It's in great freaking shape. I'm going to mail it to you. I got an extra copy for this show to give away, so let's do it now. First person to email joeonjoepod at gmail.com with the word Fortnite in the subject line, you're going to win uh, Fortnite 0. And again, that's straight from my, my heart to yours. 
Um, so listen, if that's that's it, that's all I got for you. Like these are gonna move fast. They're gonna they're gonna move quick. Get there fast. Um, don't do both. Like choose, if you if you're gonna send me an email, if you're if you love comics and you love PlayStation and you live in Los Angeles, do me a favor. Just pick one. You know, uh, it's only one winner per. And uh, uh, you know, so we want to try to spread the love here. But it's a, it's I love Snake Eyes. I love J. Joe. I'm so excited. This movie's coming out. I figure let's let's all get into it. So yeah. So thank you for listening, guys. Uh, if you've listened this far. Spread the word on social media. We got a contest going. And uh, I appreciate all of you guys. And so, uh, yeah. And so until next we meet, now you Joe. And Joeing is half the battle.